Hi, my name is Jason Mears and I'm a senior systems engineer working in the UK and I'm also part of the VMware CTO Ambassador Program. I'm going to talk you through uh, an introduction to the Software Defined Data Center and I'm going to talk you through some key concepts and some key components. So we're not going to go through every single component but we are going to talk about the main ones that you should be aware of in order to have a conversation with a customer about VMware's vision for the Software Defined Data Center. So, to begin with, we'll start with the components at a high level and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on each of them. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is VMware on-premise or data center one or your primary data center. So the first thing that most people tend to go to as a vCenter administrator is vCenter server, which is our central management console um, for managing a, a local data center. This is the place where all the other tools and components plug into. It's the single pane of glass that an administrator goes to every day to manage all aspects of a VM, VMware or vSphere environment. The next one to add on that is the hypervisor itself, the, the part that does software defined compute. So the part that takes the CPU or processor in a server and the RAM or the memory in a server and creates a, a pool that can be carved up and used by multiple virtual machines. So this is the bit that allows more than one virtual machine to run on a single piece of physical hardware. This is the product that we started with, our now known as vSphere or vSphere ESXi. It's the hypervisor. It's the bit that allows you to run multiple virtual, virtual machines on a single piece of hardware. The next part of this is our uh, software defined storage. Um, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with VMware technologies, you might know this as vSAN or Virtual SAN. So vSAN is, is a piece of software that's built into the ESX hypervisor and enabled simply by ticking a box and putting in a license key. And this allows you to turn any commodity storage already installed in the physical server that's running vSphere or vSphere ES, ESXi into a pool of software-defined storage. So what does that mean in simple terms? It means if you put lots of hard drives or, or SSDs, you know, flash drives into your servers, you can tick a box configure a piece of software and that will turn all of those individual hard drives into a shared storage array something like a typical SAM something that you might have done previously with something like an AMC or a NetApp or any other kind of shared storage device um, so that's vSAN our software defined storage product the next one is software defined networking so this is a product called NSX and this allows us to perform networking functions that, that used to always be done on a switch or a router up in the hypervisor. So you still use switches and routers, but there's a lot more intelligence and there's a lot more context and, and visibility of what the virtual machines are doing and what they're trying to talk to. And there's a, there's a better method of improving security if you can move some of those features up into the hypervisor. So this is allowing some of the services that would traditionally be in a switch or a router to actually be run from inside the vSphere host itself. So we've not only got software-defined compute for any virtual machines, we've now also got the software-defined storage, and we've got software-defined networking and security. So we really do have a, a, a single platform or a set of Lego bricks for building data centers. And I've, I've put a red box around there because I like to think of this as being the platform um, that gives you software-defined infrastructure. So if you've got software-defined compute, software-defined storage, and software-defined networking and security, we can now move a virtual machine from one site to another site and it just works. And all the um, security policies and settings and kind of um, you know characteristics of that virtual machine follow it as it moves. But there's also intelligence there because if you move a virtual machine from one site to another site, in the physical world you would have you would have had to have created new firewall rules at the second site and then remove the old ones from the original site. But because we're software defined and policy driven, those kinds of things just wrap themselves around the VM like a bubble. And when you move the VM, all of its settings and all of its policies follow it around. So you can see it's a it, it's a much more simplistic way of doing stuff you basically tell a software policy what you want to happen and it goes about making it happen whereas in the old world you would have to manually go through all the steps to reconfigure network settings and security settings and firewall rules so as i say i tend to think about this red box as being software defined infrastructure which gives you data center and cloud mobility if you've got all those three things you can move things to another data center or another cloud provider without worrying about the implications of doing the move if I'm talking to a customer who's um, 
into things like DevOps or cloud native applications or agile development. Sometimes I'll swap software defined infrastructure into infrastructure as code. It's the same kind of thing, um, but that's just the terminology that they use. So for a traditional customer, I call it software defined infrastructure. For anybody who's a little bit more advanced with things like DevOps and containers and cloud and agile development, sometimes I'll call it infrastructure as code, but it's, it's just a different way of describing the same thing. It just so happens that if you're talking to somebody who does DevOps, sometimes buzzwords like infrastructure as, co infrastructure as code will make them take a little bit more notice of things. And um, what you see in that red box there, the software defined compute, software defined storage and networking, as I've mentioned in previous videos, we tend to bundle that together as something called VMware vCloud, uh, VMware Cloud Foundation. So you, you'll hear about that in other videos and in other parts of this presentation. But th that, that key piece of Lego, as I like to think of it, if you deploy that at a data center or a cloud provider, you can then move your machines, virtual machines around at will without any kind of problems associated with doing those moves. So as I said, um, you, if you run that software platform in another location, which might be a VMware cloud provider or it might be a second data center, but because you've got exactly the same components, software defined compute, software defined storage and software defined networking, that now means that you can move virtual machines from one site, from this site to that site and they'll still work. You won't break anything. So we've now got this data center and cloud mobility, as I said there, you can literally right click on a VM and move it from one site to another without having to reconfigure anything, which in itself is quite powerful and gives you that kind of flexibility. Um, if you do have an on-premise data center and you do have a, a another data center that's, that's hosted or maintained via VMware cloud provider, you'll quite often see people referring to this as, as a hybrid cloud where you've got both private and public components and you're able to move them backwards and forwards at will. So again, that's all that's really meant by a, by a hybrid crowd. It means private stuff that you own and public stuff and an ability to intelligently move things backwards and forwards. So once we've got this platform that allows us to manage things, bundle them together into a, a software defined infrastructure and move them between data centers and cloud providers, it's all well and good having this ability to move things around, but we also need visibility of it. And we need visibility of wherever the machine is at any point in time. So if you move it from one data center to another, you want to automatically be able to see what the current state or health is of that virtual machine. Or if we move it to a cloud provider or back, we want to automatically be able to see what the current status of, of health or you know kind of um, statistics around that machine. So this is where our management plane comes in. So this is our cloud management platform. It works with local data centers and cloud providers as well. So although we call it a cloud management platform, it will run on data centers too. There, there is a trend in the IT industry to, to, to call a, a local data center or an in-house data center a private cloud if it's got some level of intelligence and automation. So when you hear the term private cloud, to some people that just means data center or server room. Um, it's just a, a more modern way of describing what we always used to call you know, the data center or the server room or the computer room. But, uh, the two terms can be used interchangeably. There is an assumption that private cloud is not just servers in a server room, it's got some level of intelligence and automation, but um, as I said, you can use the terms interoperably. So what we get with that central management platform, or that sorry, that cloud management platform, is an ability to monitor virtual machines and have a look at things like risk and capacity. So this is a product we call vRealize Operations, and it can monitor virtual machines and analyze risk and waste and capacity for local data centers and cloud data centers. It really doesn't care where it is. Wherever you put your virtual machines, it just has a view or a, a level of intelligence or a level of visibility of what's going on. Uh, the next one we have is automation and self-service. So I tend to think about this as being a, a little bit like a vending machine where you can look through the glass, you can see all the things available. And if you like the look of something or you'd like to build one of the applications or services on the vending machine, you press the button. It tells you how much it would cost to build it. And if you want to go ahead, um, 
in, a, in our version of automation and self-service, it will ask you who you are, and then it will say, who's going to take responsibility for this machine? Who's paying for this machine? How long would you like to keep it? And then what will happen when the lease or the, the, the runtime has expired? Should we delete it? Should we move it somewhere else? Or should we archive it? So in order to be able to build a machine, you first have to tell us what you're going to do with it and what its life, lifetime or life cycle is going to look like. So in simple terms, if you can't tell us how this machine is going to die, we're not going to let you build it in the first place, which helps with, with sprawl with virtual machines and, and services that nobody knows who owns them anymore. Um, as part of that, you know, being able to build things, we also have costing and comparison. So we can tell you how much it costs to build an individual virtual machine in a, in a data center. That might be a local data center or in a cloud provider or maybe even another you know, data center too. But we can also tell you what it would cost to move it from here to here or here to here, or one of the other cloud providers, maybe somewhere else. So we give you some intelligence on what things cost now, and whether you could save money by moving it to somewhere else. So literally you could say, if I was to move this virtual machine from my on-premise data center now to a cloud provider this afternoon, what would be the difference in cost? So again, it's something that most customers didn't realize we could do and are quite impressed when they see the product. And then the last part of Realize Suite is um, Log Insight which is basically a way of auditing, logging, and doing correlation on your environment. So a term or a phrase I use quite often is, when something goes wrong in IT, it's usually because something just changed. So this is the tool that allows you to see what happened before an incident, an outage, or a, or a, or a problem. And you can plug uh, physical hardware, other pieces of software and services into it. So if you've got something like a particular make and model of server, you've got a load balancer, you've got switches, um, all, there's, there's plugins for all these things so you can see visibility across everything so let's say somebody modifies the networking on your uh, blade chassis and you lose the network if you've got the right module or the right content pack plugged in not only will you see the vSphere components lose the network but you'll see that somebody just made a change to the physical hardware and that was probably the thing that caused it so I tend to think about VROPS here as being preventative maintenance, stopping things from going wrong. And I tend to think about this as being like a root cause analysis or a post-mortem type thing that allows you to either dive into detail to see what's going on or or see what caused the problem or why a problem happened after it after it occurred. So again, this is these these are four individual products but together they are the V Realize suite. And if I move on just a little bit further, we did say that we had this concept of a, of a local data center and then a hybrid cloud provider, but we've also got things like mega cloud providers, OpenStack and containers. So I'll briefly run through those now. But if you want uh, to build something or monitor something in AWS, whether that's traditional AWS or VMware on AWS or Azure or Google, all of these products and all of these services and capabilities will run just as well on a private data center as well as a VMware hybrid crowd or any of the public ones. So these these tools do really work cross cloud and cross platform um, even if even if those services have no direct correlation or relationship with VMware. <coughs> we also have an ability to run um, OpenStack which is an open source cloud platform on top of VMware or vSphere so that's VMware integrated OpenStack and we also have an ability to run containers either on vSphere itself or through the Pivotal Container Service, which is an online SaaS service. So just to, just to recap here, we've got the local data center, a VMware cloud provider, or any of the mega cloud providers, plus any of the other open source cloud providers, plus things like integrated containers, things like Docker, like Kubernetes, and the kind of things that agile developers or DevOps developers like to use. And this common management platform, which has got visibility across all of these environments so that you can make intelligent decisions about where you're spending your money, where you're placing virtual machines, and how much things are costing you. So moving on from that, um, lots of customers find this quite interesting. They're, they've gone from an environment where they might only have had vCenter server and vSphere before and are interested by all these features, technologies, capabilities, but they wonder how they're actually going to build them because it, it's new to them. So what we've got on top of this is VMware Validated Designs or VVDs. So we provide completely for free a set of validated designs and reference architectures for building out these environments. 
Um, if you go to the VMware website, you can go to www.vmware.com forward slash go, G O forward slash VVD, VMware Validated Designs, and a customer can see videos and download all of those designs from there. Um, it's a reference architecture which has been developed by some of our brightest people. It's also the environment that GSS, Global Support Services, have to hand. So if a customer does have a problem, they're not the first person that's ever used them, but support have also got an identical environment that they can troubleshoot on. As well as that, we've got education and certification. So if customers want to get trained up on a product and get certifications, that's also another option for them. And what we do find is the, the customers that have done education and certification have less problems or support issues than customers who don't. So it's kind of a proactive way of getting the best out of your environment and making the most of your investment. And then we've got professional services. So if you need some help deploying, any of these uh, tools or components or you want some custom work doing maybe you might want something like a custom dashboard for our vRealize operations or you might want help building some uh, blueprints or some some items to put in the vending machine or you might want some help with setting up some of these things we can we can do that through professional services um, which are uh, a VMware team of engineers project managers and project managers and technicians that can help a customer to build this out so I'm going to I'm going to go to each of those things in turn. As you can see on the diagram here, I've got a little tiny map here of the, the things that we showed on the first couple of screens. So so I'm going to start with the first one we had which was vCenter server. Um so this is central man central management for a local data center. Um it, 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 as I say, central point of administration and integration for data centers, clouds and computing resources, because if you do start to use a VMware cloud provider, although the resources are in a completely different building or server room or maybe even a different country, they'll still appear inside your existing vCenter environment. It will just look like a new cluster that's part of your existing environment. So um, it, it just looks like you've added a rack of servers to your existing server room um, just on a very long piece of wire out to a cloud provider. Um, things that I like about it, it's a familiar management interface that's been you know, the leading virtualization used by businesses and, and professionals for over the last 15 years. That actually is now 20 years. So it's the tool that most virtualization administrators have been using. It's familiar and all of our products and services plug directly into it. If I show you just a few screenshots on it to show, so you can see what it looks like. Um, this is an example of what it will look like um, when you log into it. Uh, an example here of a of a, um, a a data center with some clusters. In those clusters, you have vSphere hosts, and inside those clusters, you also have virtual machines. And depending on what you click on, you get some context sensitive information here around the thing you're looking at. Um, an interesting point here is all of our products and services. So this one, networking and security, NSX it's built into vSphere or the, or the vSphere website uh, web client so you don't have a separate tool for every single product other things I like about it again just showing some integration here with vSphere replication so if you use something like vSphere replication to replicate virtual machines from one site to another um, instead of using a separate tool for it you just go into vCenter you right click on a virtual machine and you can pick the things that you want to do with that's pause it, stop it, synchronize it, move it or recover a backup and, and make that into the live version but all of this is integrated into a single pane of glass so that's one of the advantages of a vCenter server it's the tool that most virtualization professionals have been using for the last 15 to 20 years and every single one of our products plugs into it so it's the um, it's basically the you know the this this the single source of administration for all of our products. Next thing I want to talk about is the, the compute part of it, the software defined compute or the hypervisor, what we call vSphere or vSphere ESXi. Um, the, the, there is kind of a feeling that hypervisor is just a hypervisor, but the stuff that we bake into our, or build into our hypervisor are these things here integrated security encryption and compliance becoming more and more important every day and it's policy driven for consistency efficiency and ease of use the thing about policies is you set them once and the environment is clever enough just to make sure that what you've asked for gets done it takes away the manual steps um, and it reduces risk because if one person does it different from another you end up with a with an inconsistent platform but also there, there are errors that are brought in by by doing things manually 
and it's the world's most comprehensive and most trusted hypervisor for the last 15 years with over 400,000 VMware certified professionals. That now that figure should be 20 years and that should now be over 500,000 VMware certified professionals. So this is the piece of software that you actually install on your physical hardware and run virtual machines on. For any of you who've used it before, this will look familiar. This is what you see as the hypervisor starting. There's a, a few screens around how you configure IP addresses and network settings for it. And uh, in recent releases, we've also got an ability to, to connect to each hypervisor individually to have a look at the local settings or local performance of each um, vSphere host. So that was vCenter Server and vSphere. The next thing I want to talk about is our software defined storage or vSAN. So as it says there, it's high performance software defined storage, but it runs on commodity hardware and it allows you to avoid large capex purchases because you scale it or build it on demand. So you only put in extra disks or resources as and when you need them. Um, it's very quick and very easy to install uh, because every version of vSphere contains all the vSAN components natively. You literally just tick a box and um, have uh, an, a user software license to turn it on. That's not to say that you can't configure it or that you shouldn't put some you know, more thought into how you configure it and deploy it, but in, in simple terms, uh, the, you know, the practical steps around turning it on and making it work is buying a license for it and ticking a box to turn it on. The thing I like about it the most is, is this um, kind of feeling that it's impractical to have dedicated storage administrators, dedicated network administrators, administrators, dedicated virtualization administrators. I have a feeling that teams are getting smaller and teams have to become multi-skilled and everybody has to understand all components because you can't be a specialist anymore unless you're in an extremely large organization. So one of the things that having vSphere and vSAN combined into the same product and into the same management interface is you have this common storage platform for on-premise or cloud but you can manage your day-to-day -day operations with one tool and one team. So it sounds quite simple, but the business benefits of having a single tool and a single team for managing those two separate things that used to be separate teams and separate people, you know, shouldn't be underestimated. Um, I've got a few slides here on, you know, what it takes to turn it on. And as I say, there literally is a button that says, turn it on. And it asks you, do you want to allocate disks manually or automatically? Do you want to enable things like deduplication and compression? So it is as simple as that to turn it on, but I'm not going to discount the fact that it actually is worth doing a little bit of design work up front and sizing it properly. You will find that, that there are sizing tools from ourselves and from partners to make this simple. I just want to illustrate the fact that it's literally a software license and a tick box in order to get it working. That's not to say that just because you can tick a box to to start it up, you shouldn't put any thought into how you're going to build your deployment. Um, in simple terms, what we've got here is three servers, one, two, three. Each server's got some hard drives or some uh, flash drives inside it. And when you tick that box and turn on vSAN, it turns all these individual drives into a single storage area network or single shared storage device that all the uh, vSphere hypervisors or, v or, or vSphere hosts can see. So we take commodity storage commodity drives, commodity flash drives, and we turn it into a big shared storage array that all the virtual machines can use. Uh, two different types, all flash and hybrid. Um, most customers now seem to be going for all flash in that the cost of um, flash drives is coming down and capacities are going up. Um, we still support hybrid, uh, tends to make sense for people who have a lot of storage, uh, need a lot of capacity, but don't necessarily need the performance, but again, um, just to show you that there's, there's two different ways of deploying it and it just depends on which kind of drives you put in your servers. Um, next thing I want to talk about is NSX and software defined networking. So kind of an oversimplification here but it's a software defined network layer that allows individual virtual machines or whole chunks of infrastructure to be moved between data centers and clouds easily and read into easily without any manual reconfiguration or network changes. So it, it kind of takes the pain out of networking. It allows you to do the things you want to do, move virtual machines and services around without worrying about the problems that's going to cause with all the network changes that need doing at the back end. It also provides world-class security 
uh, uh, isolation and integration with third-party tools so various antivirus and malware vendors and firewall vendors can plug into NSX for things like deep packet ins inspection and data loss prevention so I guess what we're saying here is not only does it have its own security features but your antivirus uh, your, and your firewall vendors and your security vendors can plug into this too to leverage or enhance the functionality that they, you already have um, and I like to think about this as a as being as it says at the bottom there a network and security bubble that wraps itself around VMs and follows them around wherever they are moved or migrated to so I tell the VM or I tell NSX which security policies and settings I want and wherever whatever anybody does to that VM wherever they move it those policies and settings follow it around without anybody having to make any changes so NSX has got a lot of tricks in its trick bag. There's a lot of good things that it can do. I'm just going to focus on three here because we have separate videos on NSX itself. But one of the things it's really good at doing is taking uh, resources. So these resources that are in Site 1, these resources that are in Site 2, these resources that are in Site 3, and these resources that are in a cloud provider, and it can create a, a layer, you almost paint a layer of NSX across these data centers, and now these separate resources all look and feel and appear as if they're on the same network so you would think all of these devices were plugged into the same switch or in the same data center because NSX can do this trick which we call layer 2 over layer 3 and what that really means to people who aren't don't have a networking background is just that everything can talk to each other regardless of which building or which country or which data center it's plugged into so we just make the network work without having to worry about all the old you know kind of re-IP and re-MAC addressing rerouting and all those other kinds of things you used to have to do to make the network work it can also do um, something which I think has been the complete opposite it can take a single data center and make it look like four or more completely different ones and the reason you would do this is that you might have customer one customer two customer three and customer four or department one two three four that all need to run um, their own virtual machines their own applications and services but they all want to feel like they've got their own dedicated network or hardware or server room so this is a way of being able to take a single shared pool of resources compute storage and networking um, but carve it up so it looks like a completely separate data center so that might be to stop people buying uh, stuff in silos or individually or it might be because every environment looks completely identical so if that environment is identical to that one, is identical to that one, is identical to that one, even down to things like IP addresses and VLANs, which are technical terms around, around networking, um, you, you usually wouldn't be able to do that in a network environment because they would all conflict with each other and clash with each other. But NSX allows you to have identical environments with identical IP addresses and VLANs on the same physical hardware instead of having to buy a separate kit. Now, sometimes that will be because this is the production environment and somebody wants to test a patch or a new program so it's quite convenient to be able to spin up an identical environment to test a patch or test a piece of software and if it breaks it doesn't take down the the real environment or the production environment but it looks identical so you've got more confidence that it might work I've also seen examples where somebody like a university might have some coursework or curriculum that they'd like to resell to multiple different uh, sets of students or organizations. So they spin up an environment and every single um, country or different type of student or different type of organization gets an identical copy of that training and they all feel that they're the only person using it. So again, that's multi-tenancy, the ability to have multiple customers, users or departments running on the same hardware um, without it conflicting or overlapping. And then another interesting thing that NSX can do, probably the thing you'll hear about more than anything else, is micro-segmentation, which in simple terms is the ability to put a software firewall around every single virtual machine that we have to stop things like ransomware and viruses and uh, other kind of cyber attack so if you can wrap a firewall around every single virtual machine and use software policies to manage it we end up having this enhanced or increased level of security and the common buzzword for this is micro segmentation but that's one of the biggest use cases for NSX and certainly the thing my customers talk about the most so moving on um, I'm now going to move to the next bit 
this part at the end there which we talked about was VMware Hybrid Cloud uh, as it says here it's a hybrid cloud that looks just like your own data center and works with all of your existing software without any modification reconfiguration or retraining if you think about it it's the same software that you're already using now the only thing that's changed is it's in a different building that somebody else is paying for it's on different hardware that somebody else is paying for and somebody else is paying for the power and the cooling and the patching so what you're really doing is taking away some of the housekeeping tasks while still giving you all of the, the, the key components that you use. So the hypervisor, the operating system and the applications. It's taking away some of the housekeeping and maintenance and letting somebody else worry about things like physical buildings, physical hardware, patching, updating, power, cooling all of, and security and all those kinds of things. By security I mean physical security to the building, not, um, not digital security. So the things that this is good for is great for disaster avoidance or disaster recovery. I prefer disaster avoidance than disaster recovery, i.e. if you can stop the problem from happening in the first place, that's better than having a way of recovering from it. Um, another use case is data center extension. So to be able to expand your capacity without having to put more physical servers in an existing site. Or maybe you could do it the other way. Maybe you could do it to consolidate data centers. Maybe you could close down a physical data center or a few de uh, physical data centers into a smaller number or even a cloud-based one managed by somebody else. Um, quite useful for, sw for swing space. So maybe if you need to move applications and services uh, and you, you want to do migrations with zero downtime or you maybe you need to power down your data center to do some work, you can move your applications and services to a, a VMware cloud provider whilst the work is done and then bring it back. And the one I see more than anything, it's it's good for dipping your toe in the water. It's good for practicing and learning how to use cloud services because lots of people have got a cloud strategy but have never done it before. So again, these are the common use cases for this. There are four and a half thousand VMware cloud providers um, as well as the ones that you'll hear about specifically like Amazon. So VMware uh, on Amazon. Amazon is just one of those four and a half thousand cloud providers. It just so happens that they're much bigger than most of the other ones and much more recognizable. But that's the VMware Hybrid Cloud. It's essentially the same components, the same software as you were using before, but somebody else paying for buildings, hardware, power cooling, and doing all the patching for you. So, an example of that might be that you have a couple of sites plus a hybrid cloud. Again, um, hybrid cloud uh, through a VMware cloud provider comes with a, a, a cut down version of NSX which can do this um, making the network work across multiple sites and what you can then do is have this consistency across your sites so again regardless of where your physical resources things like compute and storage are um, it just looks like it's a single network so this hybrid cloud part just becomes an extension of your existing network or your existing data centers. So it looks seamless. It's a way of adding capacity easily and maintaining the same kind of network settings and IP addresses and those kinds of things. So I'm now going to move up to the top row which we had here, which was the uh, management platform. So the first thing we talked about was vRealize operations, which was for monitoring uh, things like health, risk and efficiency. So health, the things that are going wrong now. Risk, the things that will break if you don't look at them soon. And then the efficiency, are you getting the best bang per book and are you using things efficiently um, and also some capacity planning in there. Uh, it can also be used for business reporting and, and you know the big support dashboards that you quite often see in the corner of the room where you have all the techies together uh, monitoring systems. Probably easier if I show you what it looks like. Um, so this is the most common screen that you'll see when you when you log in um, and it'll show you health, risk and efficiency. Things that need your attention now, things that will go wrong if you don't look at them soon and are you getting the best performance and efficiency and um, you know capacity planning out of what you've got now. So that's kind of like the high level dashboards. What I also talked about earlier is the fact that this is integrated into vCenter server. So just by clicking on a, a virtual machine, you can see its health, uh, and you can see that there are, uh, you know, 35 under workload, which isn't classed as being a problem because it's green. That would be green, uh, amber, or red. But you can see kind of kind of how the machine is looking. So you don't necessarily need a separate team of people doing monitoring with a separate set of tools. 
It comes with some built-in dashboards which are useful straight out of the box. It's probably worth mentioning as well that if you use products like Horizon or end user computing products, when you install Horizon you get some dashboards and some plugins for vRealize operations. So although this is focused around things like how healthy the server is and things like CPU and disk and networking, when you plug in the management pack for um, Horizon, that will tell you things like the user experience, how long it took for somebody to log on, how long it took for an application to start, and those kinds of things. So again, it's a single tool that's not only used with all of our stuff, so the VMware infrastructure and, and other third-party clouds, it can also be used with other products like Horizon um, for end-user computing and those kinds of things. Um, and it also comes with third-party management packs, so other vendors can plug their management packs in so that they appear here too. So that could be a network vendor, it could be a storage vendor, it could be a firewall vendor or a load balancer, it could be anything. But again, if you, as soon as you start adding these management packs in, you, you get more information in a single place and a single source of truth. And if you want to, you really can go crazy with this product. You can build your own dashboards based around the metrics and the statistics and the things that you care about. So again, um, when I worked in professional services, it was quite common for customers to want to custom dashboard, and they would quite often get professional services to come in and build them a dashboard based on their requirements, rather than somebody learn how to build a dashboard that they might only you know ever need to to build a dashboard once or twice. So sometimes that was a, a, a common engagement with professional services where they could do some custom work just to report on the things that they particularly care about. So that was vRealize and vRealize operations. Next thing I'm going to talk about is automation and self-service. So this is vRealize automation and as it says there I think about this as being like a vending machine or a service catalog for the business that allows a common friendly interface between end users and ITO developers so this is this vending machine that you go up to somebody creates um, the items in the vending machine by building something called a blueprint but once you've built a blueprint any user can go up to that vending machine and press a button and if they've got the necessarily privileges or or you know kind of access to do that they could build something whether that be a single virtual machine or a whole application or a whole service um, without having to involve somebody from IT or a developer or a programmer because the blueprint or the recipe for building it has already been done one of the nice things about it is it gives you immediate and transparent pricing of what it's going to cost to deploy in any number of data centers or cloud providers and you can compare the costs of putting it in one place or the other but the thing I like about it the most is it puts some responsibility back on the user because you have to call out up front who owns it, who's paying for it, how long you're going to keep it and what's going to happen when it comes to the end of its useful life or period of time that you've asked for it so this stops people um, just going crazy with resources because they now have to kind of tell you how they're going to use it or take some responsibility for it but most importantly you identify a, a, an owner for it and somebody who's going to pay for it so again I'll show you some examples of this now so this is what vRealize automation looks like when you very first log in you can customize and brand this screen if you want to um, this is just the standard out of the box um, an example of those buttons might be something like build me a Linux machine on Amazon Web Services uh, a Suzy Linux one in, in this example or build me an Ubuntu machine on Amazon Web Services but it might be something like give me access to the financial application now that might do nothing more than just add a user to a group but if that previously would have been a manual process that somebody from IT did that again could save you some time it, it can automate a process so we don't have to build a whole massive environment it could just be something as simple as user self-servicing um, particular things like add me to a group so I can use the finance app or it might be something like a developer who needs a two node um, SQL database cluster for two weeks if he can do he or she can just click on a button and it will build them a two node SQL cluster that will last for two weeks and then delete itself and disappear again this text this is time that IT may have had to spend doing manual tasks um, you build it with blueprints. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but just to say you drag components onto a, what we call a design canvas to make the blueprint. And as you can see down the side, it's not just for VMware products. You can see we've got Amazon, Citrix, whatever that is, generic virtual machine, Hyper-V, KVM, OpenStack, S, uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, vCloud, uh, vCloud Director. So it, it works with lots of different types of hypervisor and cloud providers. It's not just a a VMware product, uh, not just VMware centric. And 
this is just to show that it still works with the previous um, method of doing this which is orchestrator so if customers do have uh, orchestration workflows they can still be used they're not they're not uh, scrapped just because we've changed the way that we do blueprints um, so that was automation the next thing I want to talk about is vRealize business which is basically for cost and comparison so as it says the instant visibility of costs across the business for cost control comparison chargeback or showback I've even heard customers refer to this as scareback because it's scary the amount of money that some people are using um, but one of the clever things it can do is it can analyze or group costs based on location division department application service function or any other criteria so maybe some people don't care how much it costs to run the whole IT infrastructure they just care how much it costs to run the HR system or um, the database servers or any other thing you can think of or they might want to know how much a particular location or division costs um, so this product comes with a with a database that has some sensible defaults for all key components that are, that are part of this I'll, I'll show you this on the next screen um, First, I'm going to show you some high-level reporting which you can use for management reports or month-end. So, straight out of the box, it, it shows you some high-level stuff which you can see to get an overview of, um, you know, what you're using, where it's going, how, how the breakdown of hardware, storage, licensing, maintenance, labour, network, facilities, or any other costs play out. Um, how how many resources you're using from a CPU, memory, storage, and operating system license, those kinds of things. So this is kind of high-level reporting. But it also drills down and categorizes each of the components involved in running a virtual machine or an application or a service into smaller components. Uh, it does give you sensible defaults for these, but if you'd like to change it, you can. So if you know that your uh, an example I have is with hospitals that don't pay for electricity, you might want to drop the cost of electricity down to nothing because the IT department doesn't need to include that in his or her figures. It might be that you get a good deal on storage and you pay less than normal for it, so you might want to tweak that. It may be that you've got a good deal on server hardware or network switches. So again, if you want to change them, you can, but out the box it will recognize most types of hardware and put in a sensible default, um, and you can, you can start from there. So one of the interesting things that people do with it is they create something called a dynamic group, um, or, or just a group. Uh, and what you can do is you can find all the machines and all the virtual machines and services that make up an application and then say for example the HR system is using this much on this much CPU this much RAM this much on storage this much on operating system here's how it's changed over time but we can also see the total cost of running that service now if we've got Virilize operations, it can also break it down and say it's costing you £3,000 per month of which £1,000 is completely wasted because you've allocated too many processes, too much memory or too much storage. So again, another example of how the more um, VMware products you've got, the more intelligence they have and they can talk to each other and, and you know, kind of um, the value of each product gets greater as, as you know, the, the more you have. Now the, the thing that most of my customers like seeing is, is this next slide where you can take any piece of infrastructure you've already got or you're planning to use and it can tell you how much that would cost in your own data center, in Amazon Web Services or a VMware cloud provider. And you can also click up here and change those cloud providers or even create brand new ones. So this is the bit where you can see for this particular set of servers, this is how much I'm paying now this is how much it would cost if I moved it directly to Amazon Web Services natively this is how much it would cost if I went to a VMware cloud provider and it will even tell you um, how it's worked out that so I've decided it's it's 10 instances or it's 10 M3 virtual machines or you know, whatever it is and it'll tell you how it's worked out the storage as well so this is the tool that you can use to compare the cost of running something in one of your own data centers or a cloud provider or move it backwards and forwards between them Last thing I'm going to show you is uh, vRealize Log Insight. Again, I talked about this before. It's a central point for logging, auditing, and event correlation. As I said before, my experience has been that when something goes wrong, it's usually because something just changed. And the more information you can plug into this, and the more you can correlate, uh, you know, what just changed, the, the more chance you have of finding out where the problem was. As it says down here, I, th I think of it as root cause analysis or a post mortem after an outage. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of screenshots on it. 
So if you use it out of the box, it just looks like any other syslog server. N nothing too special here, except it does understand VMware constructs. So it understands things like VMware data stores or vCenter username. So it's got some intelligence in that it understands the kind of environment that it lives in. You could also do clever things in, you know, for example, this is saying, um, how many people tried to log on to my vCenter server and where did those connections come from? Now, if you end up with something like 10 or 20,000 failed attempts to log into your vCenter server, and most of them came from a, from a software script, like a Perl script or a Bash script, you can be pretty sure that that's not a person. That's probably an attack on your network. <coughs> But this gives you the ability to kind of drill down and ask those kind of kind of detailed questions to see what's going on in your network. The real value, however, is things like content packs, where third party hardware vendors or software vendors can can give you a content pack that you can plug into Login Site so information that they've got can also be integrated in. And you'll see from looking at this, we've got various things like um, storage vendors, load balancers hardware vendors, Active Directory, OpenStack, Oracle, Java, and if I move on to the, one of the next ones again, hardware provider, so this is Cisco UCS, I've got a content pack or a plugin, so things like Active Directory, Internet Information Services, so Microsoft's web server, SharePoint, again, the more of these that you add in, the more visibility and the more kind of information and context you get around your network. Um, so a, now moving right up to the top of that stack, we, we talked about it before, the fact that all of these tools and services that we've used in the vRealize suite can also be used with the mega cloud providers. Um, we can also do things with OpenStack and we can also do things with containers. So just to list a few of them here, but well, th these are other things that you can do. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. This tends to be a, a separate conversation about pri uh, public cloud and DevOps and agile development and those kinds of things. The next thing I want to talk about is these VMware validated designs, these best practice or reference designs for building a VMware environment in a highly fault tolerant and resilient manner. So this is what you get in a VMware validated design. Lots of documentation um, around why, why we've decided to do it this way, how you build it, but also things like day to operations, how once you've built this uh, environment, you should monitor it and manage it and how you recover certain components if for some reason something should fail. This is the link that you would use to go and browse these. This is available to anybody on the VMware website and some of the resources on here are quite impressive. I tend to use this one with customers. There's a, there's a huge poster that you can print out to show them what this reference architecture looks like and if I just zoom up onto a small portion of it, so I'm going to take this very small networking section here which talks about how to put the servers in your rack, what switches to use and then which network settings to use on those switches. Here's an example of that blown up. So the level in de of detail in these is quite incredible and some people will follow them to the letter and, and just follow them exactly as they are here. Other people will use them as a guide and some people just want to look at them to make sure that just to prove to themselves that what they're doing is not crazy, that it's quite sensible that some of the reference architecture do things the same way. But again, VMware validated design, I really would recommend that you look at these because they can be quite helpful in making a sale. Other things I talked about was VMware education and the ability to move from entry level qualifications like certified associate to professional to advanced professional to implementation expert and then design expert. Um, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people qualified at this end and there are roughly 250 to 300 people worldwide at this end so there's there's quite a large spread of people here. I tend to find that most IT departments it's quite useful for everybody to have this basic level of knowledge and then for somebody who's um, a specialist to have this and they'll usually be a, a certified professional in something like data center virtualization like we've got there maybe it's in cloud management and automation maybe it's desktop and mobility or maybe it's something like network virtualization but again a whole raft of qualifications and education and certification around all of our products that start from the entry-level stuff right up to the world-class expert with with uh, lots of steps in between so that's the education part. Next thing I want to talk about is VMware professional services. So um, using VMware engineers, project managers, programmers, technical staff um, to help you um, deploy 
the, the software that you've bought. So you can use professional services for most things, but there are some pre-packaged or kind of pre-built services like here. So software defined data center de design and deploy or a health check for a certain number of hosts, um, a pilot of Horizon or a health check. So again, just examples here. There are predefined services which are always changing, but you can use them on a time and materials basis as well if you wanted to for, for something that was slightly different. So again, that's the professional services. Um, if I just go right back to the start, these are all the things that are covered in this deck. If I just go back again, we had the on-premise type stuff, the VMware Cloud Provider stuff, which is the same thing, just somebody else is paying for the building, the hardware, the power and the cooling. This central cloud management platform, which has got visibility across not only these, but also some of the mega cloud providers as well. And then help with validated designs, education and certification and professional services. So that was, again, a whistle stop tour, uh, a little bit more detail than some of the other videos, but hopefully that's give you a rough idea of the key components and the key concept around VMware's software defined data center. So, Again, I'm Jason Mears, Senior Systems Engineer and CTO Ambassador in the UK. Thank you very much for your time.